Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Zoo to You online program for today. My name is Samantha, and I'm going to be talking about animal relationships and how animals help each other to survive in the wild. Um, just so you guys know, our program is recorded. So if you miss any of it, or if you want to watch it again later, it will be available to read at readparkzoo.org. Also, um, we would invite you guys to participate with our chat function. Uh, you guys will not be able to see each other's chats, but we can see your chats. And so throughout the program, we might ask you guys some questions and invite you to participate. And you guys can go ahead and try that out now. You can find the chat box function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and let us know where you guys are watching us from today. Arizona, uh, yeah, we're, we are here in Tucson, Arizona. Oh, a lot of, yep. Oh, someone from New Mexico today, welcome. It's good to see you. All right, well, thank you. We're gonna go ahead and get started with our program. Oh, and then we have a few students joining from New York. Welcome, oh, it's great to have you guys. All right, well, today we're going to be talking about um, animal relationships. And first, I want to talk about symbiotic relationships. And what symbiotic means is living things working together to keep the balance of nature. Um, so generally, it's going to be relationships between two or more species. And generally, with symbiotic relationships, there's going to be a cost and a benefit. Um, so sometimes there's positive interactions in nature, and sometimes there's kind of negative interactions in nature. Uh, so for for example, this rela a relationship between this wolf and a deer would be a predator-prey relationship. So the wolf would be um, a predator and his benefit in that relationship is that he gets to eat some food. And but however, the interaction with the deer might be a negative interaction because the deer becomes the food. So even though you have kind of these complex relationships, all of them are actually really, really important in nature and making sure that these habitats and these na the natural world uh, stays in balance. Today, I'm just gonna be talking about two different kinds of symbiotic relationships, and these are gonna be mutualistic relationships and altruistic relationships. So in a mutualistic relationships, both species are helping each other survive in nature, and actually both species are gonna be benefiting from this interaction. Another relationship I'm gonna talk about today is an altruistic relationship. And what an altruistic relationship means is that one species is gonna be helping another species, but they might not directly benefit from it. And actually it could be very risky for them. So it's kind of helping another species without expecting anything in return. And just as a note, symbiotic relationships are not just animals. So plants, fungi, algae, and bacteria can also have symbiotic relationships. So this kind of organism right here is actually called a lichen. And a lichen kind of looks like a plant, but it's not a plant. It's actually a symbiotic relationship between algae and fungi that work together to form this structure. And actually, that symbiotic relationship of the lichen is actually a part of a symbiotic relationship with this tree because the tree is actually providing a structure for it to live on. So you can have all these really cool complex interactions. So mutualistic relationships, once again, are going to involve at least two different species where everyone benefits and everyone's helping each other to increase everyone's chances for surviving. So here I've got a picture of a mutualistic relationship between a hummingbird and a flower. And so once again, mutualistic relationships are helping each other out. So how do you think a hummingbird and a flower would be helping each other in nature? Go ahead and write in the chat what you think they're going to do to help each other. All right, yeah, the hummingbird is eating. So the hummingbird's gonna be eating nectar from the flower. Yep, oh, and someone put pollen, right? See that yellow stuff on top of the hummingbird's head? When the hummingbird eats from the flower, the hummingbird gets pollen on its head and it spreads that pollen from flower to flower. And that's how flowers are able to produce seeds is from pollen being spread um, by animals like this hummingbird. So the hummingbird benefits because it gets food, and the plant benefits or the flower benefits because it gets to help, it gets to make seeds. Nice job, you guys. 
All right, so here's another really cool mutualistic relationship. Um, so this is one that's gonna happen in coral reefs. And as you can see, there's some pictures of some big fish there, but there might be a smaller organism also that's involved in this relationship. So you'll see the big fish, but do you see any smaller organisms that might be helping those fish? What do you guys see on there? All right, yes, someone sees a shrimp, right? Someone sees some smaller fish in, the, in that eel's mouth, very good. So these are what are called cleaner fish and the, and the shrimp kind of counts as a cleaner in coral reefs. So these little fish, I mean, that seems like a really dangerous place to be is hanging out inside of an eel's mouth or hanging out inside of a puffer fish's gills. But these cleaner fish are actually helping those bigger fish. So the bigger fish will come swim down to the feeding stations um, and they'll indicate to the cleaners that, hey, I'm not gonna hurt you, I'm not gonna eat you, but I really need to be cleaned. So the cleaner fish will come and they'll clean off any parasites sites um, or any debris that might be on the bigger fish and so the cleaner fish get food and the bigger fish get to be cleaned so they're both helping each other out yeah that shrimp is doing that too and the shrimp will go way down even into the fish's throat and they won't worry about being eaten and those bigger fish because these little cleaners are so important for keep, keeping them clean they will actually work very hard to protect those little fish Here's another example of some mutualistic relationships. So we see some really big African hooved mammals, but what are some little mutual, mutualistic relationships that you might see going on with these guys? What's something that you see with those big African hooved mammals? That's right, there's some little birds there. Yeah, the little birds, once again, we're having another of those cleaning relationships. Yeah, those birds, so sometimes, Birds just like to hang out and sit on top of those big mammals because it provides them some protection. It provides them a place that they can look from. Um, but these birds specifically are called oxpeckers. And once again, they're, that's why they're hanging out on the faces and the ears and the noses. It might seem like it would be a little bit uncomfortable um, to have a bird pecking at your nose, but it's much more uncomfortable having those flies and mosquitoes that might spread disease. So. Once again, the bird gets food, which is a benefit, and the mammal gets cleaned and gets safe, which is a benefit to them. So both of them are helping each other. All right, so here's another mutualistic relationship. This one is kind of a, a relationship that you might not be, might not expect, but this happens in nature a lot, um, is with ostrich and zebras. So these guys are kind of relationships where they're looking out for each other. You might not see them directly interacting, but they are actually keeping an eye on each other. So zebras, if you look really closely, have really, really big ears and they can hear really, really well. However, their eyesight is not very good. But the ostriches have really big eyes and they can see really, really well, um, but they can't hear very well. So zebras and ostriches like to hang out together because both of them are able to look out really, look out really well for predators. So zebra might hear a predator that the ostrich would miss, or the ostrich might see a predator that the zebra would miss, and then they'll alert each other and kind of watch each other's back. Yes, that's right, Sarah, they are, they're good friends. Here's another one, some, so some relationships are really big or with big animals, but some are even these tiny animals will have these mutualistic relationships. So these little bugs are called aphids. And aphids um, kind of suck the fluids from plants and produce a sweet substance called honeydew. And honeydew is really, really sweet and ants like to eat it. So ants will kind of hang around the aphids, harvest the honeydew from the aphids, but aphids actually have a lot of predators. So this ladybug here is actually a predator for aphids. And so if an, a ladybug is kind of uh, observed by the ants to be near the ladybug to be near the aphids the ants will swarm the ladybug and take it away this is an ant actually doing some protecting of some aphid eggs so the ant gets food from the aphids and the aphids get protection from the ant all right what do you guys you guys might know this relationship here or you might at least know these organisms what are these organisms that you're seeing right here Yes, 
Next, we've got Nemo's little clownfish. That's right. And Nemo, of course, lives in an anemone. Now, you may or may not know this, but anemones are actually animals. And you can actually see the anemone's mouth right here. So anemones eat by stinging um, small fish and then bringing it into their mouth and eating it. But they don't sting the clownfish. The clownfish actually have a protective layer so they don't get stung by the anemone. So the anemone is going to protect the clownfish and then the clownfish in return is going to keep the anemone clean. Some, uh, some behaviors that have been observed is that the clownfish sometimes will actually kind of move around a little bit to try to attract more food for the anemones as well. So the anemone provides a house and the clownfish will keep that house clean and uh, provide some food for their home as well. And then uh, our last mutualistic relationship that I wanted to talk about today is a really cool, unique relationship because humans, we are actually animals too. And as animals, we are part of nature and we are part of these ecosystems. And actually we have some mutualistic relationships that have gone back for thousands of years with certain animals. So this bird right here is called a honey guide. And a honey guide gets its name because it will actually bring humans to honeycombs. So there are many groups in Africa that still perform this traditional practice, but they will actually make a specific call when they're out wanting to hunt for some honey. They'll make a certain call, the honey guide will hear it, and the honey guide will go take them to honeycomb to some beehives or honeycombs that the honey guide knows where it's at. Um, the humans will then break open the honeycomb and they'll leave some out for the bird and the bird will actually eat the larvae. They love to eat the bee larvae, but they can't get to it on their own. So the humans get the honey, which is a really important source of energy and the birds get to eat the bees larva, which is a really important source of energy for them as well. So they're both helping each other hunt for these honeycombs. And this is a practice that's still actually done today. All right, so that's it with mutualistic relationships. I'm gonna talk a little bit about altruistic relationships, which is still helping each other out, but in a little bit of a different way. So mutualistic relationship is both groups benefit, but an altruistic relationship is one group benefits uh, and one group is helping the other though, but at a risk or even a cost to them. So the helper might not get any sort of benefit from the relationship, they're just doing it to help. This is less common than mutualism because generally when you're trying to survive, it helps when you're helping each other out. So scientists get puzzled a lot as to why some animals will help another even when they don't see the direct benefit. Oh, I had a real quick question um, about what larva is. Larva is baby bees. So one type of altruistic relationship will be between different species. So this right here is an orca whale. Um, and orca whales are predators. So they will eat seals, they will eat fish, they could eat dolphins, they could eat baby whales of other species. This whale right here is a humpback whale and humpback whales are filter feeders. So they'll filter the water for algae and uh, tiny shrimp um, and other just small microscopic organisms that live in the water. And this guy right here is a seal and seals um, are, general, are eaten a lot by orcas. So a behavior that scientists have noticed out in the wild is sometimes when orcas are hunting seals, um, the, the killer whale will actually move in to help protect the seal from the orca. They will try to move orcas away from the seal or sometimes they'll even swim very close to the seal so that the orcas can't reach it. And scientists don't really know why they particularly do this behavior to help the seal because the humpback whale could be at risk for injury from that encounter. Once again, humans being part of nature, and this is actually a really uh, unique kind of interaction that happens, but there have been recorded, scientists have recorded multiple times, cases where humans are swimming in the water and dolphins will come around and actually swim around the humans if there's sharks nearby and will actually protect the humans from the sharks. Once again, we don't really know why they do this behavior, especially since humans are kind of a foreign a foreign animal when it comes to that habitat. And once again, the dolphins put themselves at risk for protecting the humans from the sharks. And so once again, we're not really sure why they do this, but it's another example of altruism where the human is helped, uh, but the dolphin is putting itself at risk to do that. 
All right, one more example of altruism. This is a case where we have the same species are being altruistic from each other, even though they're from different families. So with ring-tailed lemurs, these are ring-tailed lemurs and they live in these really, really big groups um, with different families. And so there have been on occasion where a mother ring-tailed lemur will have two babies and it's a lot of work for her to take care of those two babies and it might be really hard for her to do. Um, but they have had cases where there's another female lemur who doesn't have any babies and she'll actually help take care of one of those two babies and she'll even produce milk even though she didn't have a baby of her own to be able to help take care of the baby. And producing milk is a lot of energy and it takes a lot of your body's resources to do that. So she's putting herself, she's making a cost in order to help this other mother's baby. Um, and this is one of those examples, though, where we're kind of puzzled with altruism. We're like, is it true altruism? Because she's still helping her own species. Um, and so this is one that scientists are, are doing a lot of research on. So once again, with altruism, mutualism, it's like, oh, obviously they both benefit. They're both helping each other survive. Um, but altruism, the be the survival benefits of that behavior aren't always clear. And sometimes when we look into it, it's actually an example of mutualism. We're like, oh, they're helping each other for no reason. But later on, when we research it more, we're like, oh, there actually is a reason. And this is a mutualistic relationship. Um, so altruism is really complex. It's something that is interesting to study and that we're working more to learn more about. So I will end with a take home challenge for you guys. So what is something, because once again, humans, um, we are a part of nature. We are animals living on this earth. So what is something, and you can put this in the chat, but what is something that you could do that you think you could do to help another species? Like anything, what's any way that you could help another species? And do you think that action, do you think that thing you're doing to help is an example of mutualism? where you're both benefiting from the relationship or altruism where one of you is benefiting where the other one is is not benefiting from that relationship um so go ahead and think about something like that if you'd like to share it with us that'd be wonderful or if it's just something you want to keep in the back of your mind uh, that you'd like to do that would be amazing as well so thank you so much for participating in our webinar today. Uh, if you would like to watch this again later, or if you'd like to see other upcoming online classes, be sure to visit readparkzoo.org. All of our previous classes that have been recorded are also on that website. And with that, I would love to answer any questions that you guys may have.